So one of my hopes is that such a question could be answerable someday, but I think we have to really dig a little bit deeper. I mean, an analogy that people commonly make is go back far enough in history and you find people trying to understand what life is, and they didn't have a definition of life. But now, with a lot of additional insight into biology, we talk about cells that divide, there's genes, they replicate. There's now a lot of mechanistic underpinnings that allow us to have a much better understanding of what life means. That if you go back 500 years, people would not have even had the language to describe those phenomena because they didn't know what the phenomena were. Consciousness remains elusive, even to define in an operational way, much less to explain the workings of how it occurs or to causally induce or create it. Part of what I think we have to do is to understand that process because of course all of reality that we are aware of, uh, that awareness process occurs through this thing that we haven't yet got an operational definition of. What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyun. We're on site at the Transformative Technology Conference for our second partnership with them. We're super pumped and honored to now be talking with Dr. Edward Boyden. <laughs> Hi, Ed. Hi, how are you? Thanks for coming on the program. Good to be here. Man, this is going to be so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> so pumped. Ed, you are obviously extremely fascinated with the nature of reality, why we're even here, what this all is about. Are we really all one? Well, it kind of depends where you draw the boundaries between things, right? Part of the problem with the nature of reality is that we have so much undefined words, right? So if you're talking about one, let's say we are interpreting that as a being. Um, let's say I have my consciousness and you have your consciousness. Part of the problem is we can't define consciousness in an operational way. You can't measure my consciousness. I can't measure yours. I could for all you know, be a very accurate robot sitting here right now, right? Uh, I'm not actually, but, but it's possible. So I think part of the problem with dealing with these questions is there are a lot of things that are sort of undefined. And one of my hopes is that by studying things like the brain, we can find the otherwise invisible workings of the clock, the gears and the machinery that underlies these things and start to understand how they yield functions like consciousness and awareness and cognition and feeling. So one of my hopes is that such a question could be answerable someday, but I think we have to really dig a little bit deeper. I mean, an analogy that people commonly make is go back far enough in history and you find people trying to understand what life is and they didn't have a definition of life. But now, with a lot of additional insight into biology, we talk about cells that divide, there's genes, they replicate. There's now a lot of mechanistic underpinnings that allow us to have a much better understanding of what life means. That if you go back 500 years, people would not have even had the language to describe those phenomena because they didn't know what the phenomena were. Yes, there's a tremendous amount of scientific advancement that is helping us. There is also going back, like you said in history, going back even further than what you were describing, mm -hmm does it all go to one source? Does it all go to that big bang mm. or that source or that all that is or that God or creation or whatever mm. people want to call it? Does it all go back to one? Hmm. Well, I guess it kind of depends on what you mean by one again, right? So the big bang, of course, hypothesizes that from, you know, this nothingness fluctuation, you can get everything. So maybe it goes back to zero by that definition. Um, but again, I think part of the problem here is you know, um, is this operational definition question. So you can describe things up to a certain point, but then looking beyond that is a speculation, right? So even people who study the first zillionths of a second after the Big Bang will freely admit that their theories cannot go back before it, right? So I think this is this sort of tension in where science meets philosophy, right? And that actually was what I, one of my original motivations. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I was a kid, I was about eight years old and I went through a very religious phase um, and I really wanted to understand the human condition because I felt that, you know, look at the suffering, look at the, the misery, but also just the puzzles, you know, why do we do what we do and why do we feel what we feel? And, um, how do you I feel about, that, uh, go ahead. Yeah, well, yeah. just to finish the thought, yeah. uh, one of the things I really hoped was that maybe we could 
drive science far enough that we could have more mechanistic things to say about human yes. existence. Yes, this is extremely important. So the questions you're asking are immensely important, but I guess the way uh, to summarize what I'm saying yes, is yes. that I, I feel like we're not ready to answer these questions, but maybe we can prime yes, the pump yes. and get to this that is, point. This is great. This is the marriage of science and spirituality. Um, this is the two sides of the same coin. This is where science can advance itself to prove some of the things. Then there's many things in both of the fields that have certain issues with them, even in science. Um, that are, uh, in a sense, uh, have some sort of perverse incentives attached to them or whatnot. Mm. But let's let's stay with this for a moment. Is everything interconnected? Well, there are a couple of ways to look at that. So one, of course, is the, the physics way of looking at it, where things interact through forces and exchange energy and so forth. And, and so there's sort of a, a way of describing the connectedness between things. And then there's also sort of... Um, almost sort of a computational level. You know, uh, Turing, Alan Turing, the computer scientist, uh, famously proved that, you know, the halting problem that you, you can't, with a, an algorithm, predict whether a computer program is going to halt or not um, in the context of a Turing machine. And so one of the things that is sort of interesting is to think about, well, are there fundamentally unpredictable things? Or with enough information, can you predict what's going to happen? And I guess the way that uh, such uh, things are interpreted has to, in the end, boil down to the connectedness between things, how they interact and so forth. Yes, and another way to f even dive potentially into uh, something that uh, when our children are born into the world, if the, if, the re if the realization is passed on to them from their parents as well as the community, the social fabric around them, there is profound awareness shifts that happen when we're instead of when we're born and we think you're separate, you're separate, you're separate, that you think of things and you feel things like the air that I'm breathing in is the air that phytoplankton and trees are breathing out. This water that I'm drinking, this apple that I'm eating, these things are powered by the sun. And that's what gives me the energy. Mm -hmm. That cycle of interconnectedness is unprecedented. And it's it's in science. It's just, mm. it's in science and in spirit. And mm. that's where I feel like those things marrying right there, mm -hmm. it just, it, it transforms our society, I think, potentially faster than anything else. Would it, could it potentially be that then those feelings of separation mm -hmm. that many of us feel at times would those feelings of separation potentially be a root of one of one of the roots of so many of the problems that we have in our world well i guess another way to look at your question mm -hmm. is um are we interconnected and how but um a way to flip that question on his head is what can we do about it mm -hmm. are there ways to be more interconnected yes so i've been meditating a lot over the last 10 years and recently i've been talking to friends and colleagues and trying to learn other meditations than the ones that i've been practicing and so there are meditations where you imagine um, visual or visualize yourself merging into the air and then from the air into the sky and yes. from the sky into the forest. And, and you can feel yourself, you know, uh, it's very visceral to me, yes. becoming bigger and more integrated with other parts of the universe. And yeah. um, I was in Norway with my family in August and was sitting on the, the edge of the, the water and felt myself, you know, becoming part of the water. And then the water yes. touches the mountain and it led to this very expansive feeling. Yes. So I guess there's one way to look at it, which is here's what we have. And also there's a lot of stuff we don't know. But a third way to look at it is what are we going to do about it? Yes. Is there a way to cultivate enlightenment and empathy and so forth? And yes. I guess if I go back to how I thought about science intersecting with philosophy as a child and searching for ways where they might impact each other, you know, one of the ways to look at my long-term desires for brain science is can we end in some kind of more enlightened state? Exactly. Yes. Yes. And I love how you go to these solutions of things like practicing the process of the drop rejoining the ocean. This is a very beautiful and eloquent way to describe uh, one of the most uh, common processes that if we train ourselves on a moment to moment basis to be one, mm -hmm. that can do potentially all of the work that sure. needs to be done to solve so many of the issues. Well, that another we meditation have in our world. is the metta, where you um, visualize and convey empathy and love on close friends and loved ones, and then strangers, and then to yeah. distant people who even might be wishing you harm. And that's another way to uh, try to transform one's relationship to others uh, for the better. And and so I've been practicing that as well. And it's a, it's very interesting how it changes your perspective on things and maybe even changes you yourself yeah. over yeah. long periods of time. 
these are excellent um, techniques. Like you said, there's this strategy. I'm, I'm very fascinated with this question and hearing your answer to it. What is the purpose of this reality? So again, I kind of think this is something that requires us to, to delve into things more. Let me tell you how I think about it. So for me, the biggest question is why do we feel our feelings and are aware of things in a way that, for example, I could program a robot to, you know, drop a hot object if it touched it, but it wouldn't feel the heat the way that you or I feel it. And so far that evades uh, easy description. I mean, there are even examples in philosophy where you could, uh, you know, the zombie hypothesis where, you know, you make a, 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 a hypothesis. What if somebody had neural mechanisms that did everything that you did, but they didn't have an associated feeling with them, right? Anyway, I guess what I'm trying to, to say is that there's sort of this entity that appreciates reality, and we don't understand much about it. Um, consciousness remains elusive, even to define it in an operational way, much less to explain the workings of how it occurs or to causally induce or create it. So uh, part, I think, uh, part of what I think we have to do is to understand that process because of course all of reality that we are aware of is only uh, that awareness process occurs through this thing that we haven't yet got an operational definition of so. this is again this is this continued push that you've had for the longest time and this is one of the things that is so crucial to the ethos of our show and into the ethos of yourself this pushing of the edge of what's known in the world and then as you do that process it gives you deeper and deeper insight into all of these profound philosophical questions about the nature of reality this is absolutely true and that's why the process of pushing the edge is so important so when you see civilization's edge of knowledge and you see us pushing it with the scientific method and trying to understand more you know you pick the brain and you pick where you go and you also have to pick your strategies at mm. how you kind of chip away mm. at that edge right. over time and you only have so many so much time you only have so many other people that work in the synthetic neurobiology lab how do you guys pick what to do how do you guys pick the biggest questions that are trying to get at those biggest ultimate nature of realities well three thoughts so one is that people have studied the mind through psychology and the brain through neuroscience for many years. But I think one of the things that eludes us is the incredible, almost unimaginable complexity of the underlying machinery. And that's what led me, uh, when I entered neuroscience about 20 years ago, to make the hypothesis that we need better tools, better ways to see, better ways to control, and better ways to map what the brain does. And that sort of triumvirate of goals is really what drives a lot of what we do in our group to invent tools that can solve those three aspects of the brain and then to apply them in a systematic way to see what those hidden workings do. So if we project it forward a bit, you know, what I hope is, you know, when we feel a conscious sensation or when we are making a conscious decision, presumably those states are being created by processes that occurred before the state arrived in its existence. And if we can understand that process, maybe that is what leads us to an operational definition of consciousness. It's elusive to try to grasp it in this moment of occurrence, but if we can see what happens before that leads to it, that might give us a unique handle. And so what that means is we have to really look at the internal states of the brain. It's not enough just to look at the outward behaviors, um, because if I put a coffee cup down and turn my head to the left, um, that might be a behavior, but it might not reflect what I was feeling. Maybe I was feeling you know, anguish over a loss from many years ago, or maybe I'm joyful that you know, tomorrow I'm gonna meet with an old friend or, or who knows what. So the internal state is important to study, but it's so hard to grasp. You've mentioned this and you're so focused on it, it the process of building tools to probe at exactly that, the complexity of that. Mm -hmm. The process of building a tool that helps people push an edge makes it so that the edge can be pushed faster. Mm -hmm. This is a main important philosophical point that you carry and that it seems to be that it basically pushes the edge. It makes creates like a bubbled explosion at the edge instead of just a tiny little pixel that's moved at the edge. It creates a bigger bubble of more pixels that open up thanks to this tool. 
and so then, yeah, go ahead. Well, we try to build tools that have three properties. First is that I really like this concept, although it's also a little bit ill-defined, of ground truth. Can we find the ultimate mechanisms and reasons why things happen? Boiling down something as complex as a behavior or an internal state, ideally down to the physics and chemistry um, that makes it work. The second thing is we want tools to be easy to use and for others to be able to learn how to use them rapidly. So when we build a technology like optogenetics or expansion microscopy or other tools, we try to teach them and spread them to hundreds, even thousands of different researchers all over the world because it's a, it's a try to catalyze serendipity, right? You know, this yeah. is such a complex problem. Let's make tools that can empower many, many people in, uh, in their own ways to start to probe these issues. And then finally, um, I want to integrate the tools. So it's not enough to just, just use one tool. If you see something happen, yeah. but how do you know what is the important part? So you need to perturb the system in order to understand what's really important. And then of course, what is the structure? How does the building blocks uh, that comprise the structure, how do the building blocks that comprise the structure make it do what it does? So one of my hopes in the coming years is to integrate the observation of the brain, the control of the brain, and the mapping of the brain into a single unified pipeline that lets us maybe ultimately, this is a bit speculative, but it's a, it's a hope to make a, uh, a computer model of yeah. thinking and feeling and these other yes, otherwise yes. elusive concepts. So then it could potentially be at the, again, this, the, this, this word, it's so interesting, the, <clears throat> the chemo electroconnectome at that level of brain mapping could potentially be a catalog of a specific emotion or feeling or a process of thinking something could be mapped at that crazy complex level of what's actually going on in all of the the brain well let's break it down a little bit what do we need to know to solve the brain is it enough just to have the geometry of the wires to see how the they're connected up in some topological um mesh do you need to know every molecule every molecule of water of oxygen you know those are sort of two extremes right yeah. And so one of the big questions, of course, is, well, we don't know for sure what all the mechanisms of the brain do. I mean, there are brain cells that make uh, cannabinoids, uh, molecules that act a bit like the active ingredient in marijuana. There are brain cells that make gases, like nitric oxide, that are going to diffuse around. That is nuts. Which of these things yeah. are important for specific computations, behaviors, internal states? The honest answer is we don't know. And part of the problem is we don't have a full catalog of what all the molecules in the brain do. So what I hope is that um, we can make very detailed maps, but I think there's also going to necessarily be a cycle where we acquire knowledge, we try to synthesize it into, let's say, a computational model or derive principles from looking at the organization of biomolecules or wires in the brain. But those models will probably initially fail quite a bit. But here's what I hope for. Those, fa those failures are going to be constructive failures. They're going to tell us what to do next. So if we miss something uh, that can't explain the data, you know, we're missing something uh, where cells that are far apart can coordinate their activity, well, maybe there's some kind of diffusible messenger that connects them across space and time that's not apparent in the wiring. And I think we have to be open to these possibilities. This continued process of probing into what we think is the deepest complexities of the brain continue opening up more and more fields at the edge that have been we didn't even think existed. We were just doing the the Brain Mind Summit at Stanford, mm -hmm. and there was the Consciousness Day uh -huh. as well. And that Consciousness Day, again, was so mind-blowing. There's so many mm. interesting aspects that we were never thinking of. What does... What do anesthetics have to do with consciousness? Mm -hmm. How can those give us signals about mm -hmm. what consciousness is? How can you actually do something like do a, an analysis of fMRI, EEG, EKG, <clears throat> all these different biometric signals from the body during a state of interconnectedness, during a state of unconditional love? during deep presence mm. and what would that prove to the world when you're in that sort of a state what would your biometrics say when you're in that sort of a state how harmonic potentially would it be hmm well i'm a pretty empirical thinker so i would take a look at the data and want to know what does the data say is it correlating with the state can it predict a state 
we don't have an overarching theory of the brain or the mind yet. So it has to be very data-driven. Maybe the signal quality is good enough that you can correlate or predict a brain state or a behavior. Maybe the signal quality isn't good enough. Or maybe you have to invent a new algorithm. You know, machine learning, for example, of course, is sweeping many fields uh, of science, including neuroscience. Um, are there strategies to infer from what looks like a noisy signal something that is very powerful? But ultimately, the burden of the proof relies on the people acquiring the data and trying to test the theory um, to, to, to do the work. And it's hard work. Um, but until we have an overarching theory of the brain or mind, I think it has to be pretty empirically driven. When you describe your feeling of being, it was in Norway, is that right? Oh, when I was doing that meditative practice? Yes, that was in Norway. Yeah. When you're there and you're experiencing the process of your drop rejoining the ocean of all that is, mm -hmm. what, do you, what was going on in your biometrics? Hmm. Well, I wasn't monitoring anything, but I felt very calm. Um, and I felt joyful. Um, I wasn't monitoring in great detail, but I, I seem to recall my heart rate, you know, stabilizing and so forth. So there's lots of physiological correlates to these states. I guess the big question is, are any of these states, um, are these physiological correlates causal in some interesting way? In other words, you know, sometimes there's always the question of, do you have the causality inverted? I think I'm doing A and it results in B, but how do you know that B is not feeding back and causing A? And uh, I think part of the question here is that we might need technologies that not just let you map and look at the brain, but connect it to the rest of the body. Of course. And so there's lots of people who are yes. investigating the gut-brain relationship now. Exactly. Vegas. Uh, they might even have pathology uh, consequences. You know, there's a theory now that maybe totally. changes in the gut could lead to Parkinson's disease. That's right. yep. uh, yep. So there's a lot of realization that we have to think of the brain as a focal point, but it's not the only focal point. We have to think of the body as a system. And then, of course, humans create systems together. You know, I may be born with very little knowledge about X, Y, or Z, but I read a book or I talk to somebody and suddenly I've acquired essentially what somebody else in their life figured out or some set of people figured out. Yes. So at least these concepts like extended intelligence, right? Yes, Where, yes, yes. You know, um, We're talking about this edge of knowledge, which is literally pushed by the 100 billion humans before us that built this world yeah. that we live in. That's, that's why it's so far out right now. Well, that's part of why also when we build a tool, we want to give it to hundreds or yes. thousands of other scientists. Yes, yes, because yes, yes. You know, if we monopolize the technology and make a few paltry discoveries you know, in a small academic group, well, when that's, what's the point of building such a tool? We should try to help. Yes spread it because otherwise the probability that a line of inquiry might end without reaching a satisfactory conclusion goes up. Yeah, I love the focus on democratization of the tools that push the edge. So important. Super important. Um, these feelings of, you said, joy, calm, these feelings that you have when you're in these states of interconnectedness, could it be that your biometric readout is actually, when I feel deep states of interconnectedness, potentially the same as my biometric readout? Well, that's a good question. I mean, um, everybody's different, of course. And uh, there are ways to classify people's personalities, of course, and, and how people react to things. Uh, people react to stimuli in very different ways, right? There are people who, when they hear music, will get chills running down their spine and the people who, you know, music doesn't do a lot for them. So I think the question you're asking could be turned on its head a little bit and ask, well, what are the differences in the human condition? You know, how many different kinds of experience do we have? And this is a very hard question to answer. I mean, even old philosophical questions like, is the red you see different from the red I see are, are very difficult to confront. Or is this when we do see that red, is it, could it be a very similar biometric readout. And, and even it is though, what, what does it mean? So if there's a the, biometric readout, what is its use or what is its explanatory power? Right? The power I think of the, m the most important um, biometric readout is the biometric readout during states of interconnectedness or unconditional love or deep presence. Mm -hmm. And then seeing if that same biometric readout is applicable to when you're feeling it or when Brady's feeling it because if it is that is so powerful for us to be able to figure out who is actually enlightened and who is not and why is that important well who's leading our governments 
Who's leading our corporations around the world? Who are the billionaires around the world? And how deep have they went into these feelings of interconnectedness? And if they haven't yet, then maybe it's important to help catalyze that, just like it is on a grassroots level for people to have more feelings of interconnectedness. Well, one thing I'm thinking a lot about is also whether the feeling of something relates to the actual something. So there are people have done experiments where, you know, they'll give them a task and um, some people feel like they're really good at the task and some people feel like they're not good at the task. And there are a lot of people interested in this question, do feelings of understanding or other, other um, interesting properties of a state, do they correlate with actual understanding and so forth? So one of, my, one of my concerns is maybe there's a disconnect there. You know, there might Agreed. be people who feel like Agreed. they understand and are empathetic and so forth, but yeah. Yeah. are they really yes. understanding and And then this is exactly why a, if we can figure this out, which we will figure this out, I'm very confident that we will get this, it would be able to showcase when someone is doing this intellectual masturbation around saying i am feeling interconnected versus actually being able to read out their biometrics and prove whether or not they are and then it can also be a good feedback loop for people that are actually trying to train their states of interconnectedness to know exactly what you were talking about if it's actually landing that if that feeling or rather not and it could be based on the biometric state of the body and this is i think such an important place in uh it, this is like, if not one of the most important things I think about neuroscience and just about this beautiful divine body that we all get to adventure into consciousness in. Can we figure out what is going on in the biometrics of the body, the heart, the gut, the brain, as we were talking about, when there are feelings of interconnectedness? When there are, Ed, you know this, you have children. When you have children, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. When your wife gives birth, this is a game changer. Mm -hmm. your, your consciousness is shifted to brand new dimensions. Mm -hmm. It's never been in before. All of a sudden, you become interconnected with this child even before you, when it was the gestation process was happening. Mm -hmm. Do you, those feelings of interconnectedness can <laughs> potentially be quantified and then more deeply understood. And then again, this process of, can I really tap deeper into the water I drink, the food I eat, the, the air that I breathe? Do I feel this deep process of interconnectedness? Mm -hmm. Because if I do, can that potentially solve so many of the, the world's challenges that we face? Maybe. I mean, I think one of the reasons that attracted me to trying to see how science could help philosophy is also it could be that we need a much more precise description of some of these things in order to make progress. So part of the problem with how we think about economics or psychology or, or these uh, phenomena that we engage in as humans is also that there's a lot of underlying machinery that can sometimes be in a chaotic state, right? And it's, you, we can describe things at an outward level using things like biometrics and, and external observation, but it can make it, uh, or it can be difficult to understand because the internal processes that yield the biometrics yeah. could be far more complicated. Yeah, yeah. Um, for example, I might in my mind have a whole series of events as my mind wanders, which lead me to think about, you know, we mentioned Norway earlier, so I'd think about water and then fish and then salty sure. tastes and then and then I eventually pick up the glass of water yeah. and your biometric analysis would conclude something about my hand muscle moving but you would not have known anything about Norway and fish and salt right yeah, so I, at a very low I, resolution I, level this is why I focus so much on the brain because I think we need to find those internal mechanisms and workings that generate these outwardly manifested yeah biometric yes, states yes, rather than focusing yes. only on these external metrics in in a sense I love seeing it as a big catalog a big library of states of consciousness and the ins ins insane mechanisms that are happening in the brain at all of those different states of consciousness and um at the most highest resolution level that would be incredible to have that and it requires the pushing of the edge like like you and your team do
this is another this is so, so related to what we were just talking about regarding what the, in, this incredible initiative of brain mind is doing mm-hmm. these new funding vehicles this is not sometimes it's just not something that is venture backable that's going to give you some return over a period of years but it requires something different sometimes scientific advancements require different funding strategies mm-hmm. speak speak to the different funding vehicles that you see that are evolving there's a need to address two things one of course is that really great science is often unpredictable because if you could predict it fully then you know is it really necessary right you already knew the answer the other thing of course is if you want to take a technology or discovery and mature to the point of helping people in everyday life then that does require some deployment or often commercialization or dissemination effort so part of what i've been thinking a lot about is how to connect those early stage exploratory serendipitous events to the value that people eventually yeah. will appreciate yeah. and so uh you know today i talked in the seminar that i gave a bit about this three-part model invent a deep science tool optogenetics to perturb the brain, expansionary cross to map the brain, help other people make discoveries with it. Yes. There's Alzheimer's, there's depression, there's schizophrenia, there's basic questions like what is a, an emotion or what is a, a feeling? Yeah. And then once you have a deep understanding, deeper than previously possible ideally, then that's the time to go and design the innovation or invention that goes out into the world. And this model we've now applied in, in a number of contexts um, and it's been very, very exciting. Tool democratize so. and then do the invention. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Like that a lot. And so, so the, the the tension, the funding, of course, is how do you connect the value in stage three when the ultimate invention gets out to help yeah, yeah. people in the clinic, and to recognize the yeah. scientific tool that yielded it all back in the beginnings. Yes, and fund that. So it's almost as though you have to sell as a proposed down the line value that your immediate family members are going to get these these tools of assistance with their potential neurodegeneration or any neuropathy or what have you, um, or pathology of any sort, and just sell them on that vision at the earliest stages for your process of tool development. But the problem is, because there's two leaps that you have to make, it's very hard to see that connection. So I think one possibility would be to explicitly build such a network. What if there were a large number of scientists who would take new tools and apply them to lots of problems? You know, what if we started making maps of, I don't know, all diseases or something, right? To set a, a really ambitious goal. And then we're gonna go build these imaging tools that will yield the maps. So now I've connected the technology to the potential for discovery. And then of course, can we connect the potential for discovery to the third stage, the design. Okay, if we have maps of all the diseases, we're going to get drug targets yeah. in mind and be, be able to build more targeted pharmaceuticals than ever before. You know, most drugs are pretty messy, brain drugs amongst the messiest of all uh, in terms of side effects. But if we had a map and we like yes. said, look, this target's in these seven brain circuits, but not these other 34, we might be able to design a new technology that could be deployed into the medical world that would be ultra specific. I mean, this is just an idea now. I like but this it's an a exciting lot. one to me. It's it's as though if we create the uh, the just a, a better knowledge graph, then we can show the we can sell more easily the actual story. Um, and also, it helps yeah. to, over time to have track record too. Yeah. So yes. When we started yes. doing neurotechnology, which was before neurotechnology was cool, um, a lot of people didn't buy it, and. Uh, a lot of engineers, I felt, thought that the brain was a little bit too nebulous. You know, if you really wanted to be a bioengineer, you'd go after DNA, right? That's the, the fundamental thing. And then also, I think a lot of uh, neuroscientists at the time uh, distrusted technology. There just weren't that many technologies that were that useful in everyday life. You know, there was like a couple things that in the last uh, in the couple decades before, we started trying to crank these technologies out in a serial fashion that achieve widespread use. And so... But one way to make it possible is to be very concrete about it. You know, let, let's make yes. deployability into the scientific, scientific community a goal yes. and keep that in mind at the forefront. I love that. I love that, Ed. That's so huge. Ed, <laughs> I want to hit you with this question. This question is now so close to, again, <clears throat> our hearts, well, you know, in the question of what is the purpose of all of this. Is humanity a biological bootloader for digital superintelligence? Well, I think there's a lot more than just intelligence. You know, suppose you had a robot that was just like you, 
It was as intelligent as you. It could do everything you did, but it wasn't aware. Which you, would you rather have around on Earth? You know, that or, you know, you with your awareness? What if the digital superintelligence is both intelligent and aware? So again, it goes back to the lack of an operational definition of consciousness. We don't have a consciousness meter. We don't know how to create consciousness. So I don't know the answer to your question. You, you created consciousness with your children. Uh, I think it's probably a stretch to say that I created the consciousness, right? You know, maybe cells divide and over time they form a brain and then the brain You're is a part of it. But, yes, yes, yes. But, but if you if you think like that, then, part, yeah. then you could say that this water created consciousness because without water, the people wouldn't reproduce, right? So I, I don't know if this is okay. the right way Well, to think this is it. the interconnectedness of, of everything. Yeah, but, but if you're willing yes. to say that water creates consciousness, then, then how do, it's very it's hard to make this scientifically. Or is panpsychism is all actually <clears throat> consciousness? So again, I don't know and if it, we can, just because we can't measure it or create it, I don't know how to answer that question. Interesting. Yeah, there's there's a lot of ways to um, wander down that um, that digital super intelligence conversation um, and plenty more times to endeavor into the nature of reality as we both dive uh, deeper into, you know, um, our understandings of, of what this all is. Yeah. Last question. Sure. What is most beautiful in this reality? I can only pick one thing. What is most beautiful, Ed? Well, you know, earlier we talked about family and children, and I think that the beauty of that is sort of multidimensional. One, of course, is just the direct emotional connection, um, you know, with uh, yeah. a spouse or a child. Yeah. But then also as a neuroscientist, it's been fascinating also to watch aspects of personality emerge. Yes. Um, so uh, our son is almost 10 and our daughter just turned 7. And to watch their creativities and storytelling abilities and and personalities and and goals emerge as distinct entities is just fascinating. So I think you know the, the beauty here is multidimensional. There's the emotional level, but also the intellectual level, and um, it, it makes me even more want to sort of achieve those twin goals that you know I, I talked about in the seminar earlier to yeah. figure out how we can heal suffering through ground truth mapping of what's going on in the body and the brain, but also understand, you know, the human condition, you know, why do we do what we do? What is the brain yes, yes, doing yes. when it generates our minds? And we have so many unanswered questions there. So um, I think in our interview, I had a lot of responses where I said, well, we just don't know. Maybe we should redo the interview in 20 years. I'm like, okay, here's, here's what we figured out. <laughs> and Ed's other, but in some ways, you had your other the famous last... one was, let me uh, flip that question on its head. That was your, let me rephrase that. Yeah, that was your other one. Well, but yeah. I think it's important. It's because, extremely important. Because yes. this, yes. Is, this yes. is kind of how we approach a lot of our problems, right? Somebody comes to us and says, oh, we need a better, I'm just going to make this up, but uh, a better surgical instrument. Actually, this actually did happen. People came to us and wanted better surgical, mm. surgical instruments. And we started thinking, what if we just made the brain stimulation non-invasive, so you wouldn't need mm -hmm. the surgery at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So turning the question on its yes. head yes. and trying to understand is there a deeper question underlying the overlying question is one of the, the methodologies that we routinely practice. And I think it's one of the reasons that we can, as we talked about earlier, try to aspire to tools that get down to the ground truth. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's like the old saying, you know, if Henry Ford asked people what yeah. they wanted, they would have all say, said they wanted faster horses, horses right? Yeah. Because they didn't they have the concept of the automobile in their minds. Yeah. So digging one level deeper is at the core of, core of everything we do. Yeah, yeah. I like that a lot, Ed. Okay, you have two kids. What are you going to recommend them as a skill to learn going into this age that we're all endeavoring into? Well, I think a lot of the things that uh, we've been talking about, I, I think, can be made into learnable, teachable skills. Digging one level deeper, trying not to make too many assumptions, um, trying to think of alternative strategies to what is the current accepted path. Uh, thinking from first principles as much as possible. It's not just an incremental building from a past data point, but what's really going on under the hood and can we get to that fundamental truth? Yeah, those are huge. Ed, thank you very much for joining us on the show. Great. It's been an it's honor. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. Woo, such a good one. Really appreciate you. Thank you, Ed. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode, all the different topics that we talked about regarding the nature of reality and neuroscience. Check out the links in the bio below, syntheticneurobiology.org, also edboyden.org, and Ed's Twitter profile. Check those out. Check out the links in the bio below to the Transformative Technology Conference as well. Check out those links. Support them. We'd love for you to do so. 
Also, thank you very much, Brady Sprunger, for co-producing the show. Really appreciate you, brother. Thank you very much. Check out the links in the bio below to simulation. Support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow. You can find all of our links below Patreon, cryptocurrency, PayPal. Uh, you can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. And check it in 20 years when we have the answers to some of these questions. Part two in 20 years. <laughs>